Okay. You need me to keep talking? <laughs> need me to test this one as well? How's this one?
to everyone amen welcome to another sunday school lesson in church of jesus christ amen so glad to see the faces that are here we know some are probably listening to us by streaming amen we say good morning to you and welcome to the class we have a wonderful lesson today man jesus calms the storm amen because storms are going to happen in everyone's life amen at some point in time the focus verse comes out of matthew 8 and 27 but the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that the, even the wind and the sea obey him? The lesson text comes out of Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27, Mark chapter 4, verses 37 through 41, and Luke chapter 8, verses 23 through 25. The truth about God that we should take away from this lesson, that Jesus is the Lord, God who rules the raging seas. True for my life is since Jesus can sleep during a great tempest, I do not need to fear a storm. Amen. Amen. And if anyone has any comments as we're moving through the lesson, feel free to come up to the microphone. Amen. And make your comments. Amen. Beautiful lesson connection. Amen. But before I get into it, let's breathe a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, in your name, God, we do thank you for being the God who calms the storms, hallelujah. And even if the storms don't cease, God, you know how to calm our spirits in the midst of storms. Oh God, we ask that you just have your way in Sunday school, have your way in our morning worship all day long, God. Get your glory out of our lives. Continue to build us up to be the people you have us to be. We thank you for all things. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wonderful lesson connection. And if... I don't know if the uh, small books y'all have have the uh, a photo of of the you know the uh, Rembrandt painting. I know we have it. That's that's the actual depiction of the painting. Amen. So it talks about the fame and the lesson connection. The fame artist Rembrandt Van Rid um, painted hundreds of scapes on canvas, but he only painted one seascape. He painted his renowned. Christ in the storm on the Sea of Galilee in 1633. In the Lexham Geographic Commentary of, on the Gospels, Gordon France tells the story of this especially special work of art. A keen eye for geography and theology may pick up a few interesting features in Rembrandt's depiction of the storm. He was painting in Amsterdam, not at the Sea of Galilee. He didn't have the luxury of watching a ship toss and list in Israel, but he painted what he thought it might have looked and felt like. Further, although the biblical account tells us Jesus was on board with his 12 disciples, we count 14 men on board the boat in the painting. Since Jesus was already on board, we can conclude this painting is a de depiction of the storm he calmed with only his word. Again, all those reference scriptures that we read earlier. Franz describes the painting as depicting the panic-stricken disciples in their fishing boat trying to regain control of the vessel after being caught in a certain fierce storm on the Sea of Galilee. A huge violent wave is crashing over the bow and the sail is ripping as the boat draws perilously close to some rocks and the worst thing for any sailor certainly the captain of the boat is running aground on rocks there are 14 people in the boat the lord jesus his 12 disciples and a 14th individual most likely rembrandt himself because he was known to paint himself into his pictures that i i thought that was so humorous i, I never knew that about him amen one of the disciples is shown leaning over the edge of the boat, apparently seasick and vomiting. <laughs> That's very common if you get seasick. It was probably Judas, since he was the only non-Galilean among the 12 disciples from the city of Kerioth, south of Hebron in Negev of Judah. He was not accustomed to sailing in a boat. The Galileans were. Rembrandt's masterpiece prominently hung in Boston's Illabella Stuart Gardner Museum until March 1990, when two men posing 
as police officers stole it along with other dozen works of art. To date, none of the works of arts have been recovered. It is fitting that one of the stolen works of art will Rembrandt's Christ in the Storm. We all know what it's like to be to feel displaced and fearful as we face life's storms. Thankfully, like the disciples, we do not face those storms alone. I said, what, how, how the man going to steal a picture of Christ? <laughs> How, how do you live with yourself doing something like that? <laughs> Thieves don't care, I guess, right? My gosh. The Psalms anticipate the calming of the sea. The Psalm and Songs. And most of us know that the Psalms, when they were penned during those times, many times they were the musical, you know, they were accompanied in the music of the ancient Israeli worship. Amen. And many times churches still, you know, recreate and pin them to songs. And I think they make some of the most beautiful Christian music. And man, the New Testament is rich in its use of Old Testament scripture, quoting, paraphrasing, or alluding to the Hebrew scriptures approximately 800 times. Uh, both testaments are, the Christ, are Christ-centered. The Old Testament points ahead to the coming Messiah, in the era of the New Testament, he has come to help Jesus' disciple understand the scriptures. Jesus said, all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Amen. Uh, Luke 24 and 44, very uh, common scripture that our pastor likes to reference. And it is beautiful. Amen. And it, you, as you'll notice in my teaching, I love making if I deal with anything about Jesus in the New Testament, I love finding the Old Testament reference, amen, and tying those together. Whenever I'm teaching, preaching, or whatever, I, 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 it just blows my mind, especially when I think about the religious leaders, when all of the Old Testament was all the images of him, and they couldn't still see who he was. My gosh. Mm. Amazing. Um the New Testament writers quoted the book of Psalms more than any other book. Amen. 206 references to the Psalms punctuate the New Testament. The book of Psalms was the hymnal for the children of Israel. I made reference to that. It is interesting and important to note how the Psalms are intentionally arranged. Amen. They, they're arranged the way they are for a purpose. Amen. Many, many English translators indicate the book of Psalms consists of five smaller books. Amen. So if anybody ever asks the question, how many divisions of Psalms are there? Don't say 150. What they're looking for you to say is five. Amen. Amen. And again, it breaks them out you know, the, the way they were um, in the time that they used them. And again, some of the better Bibles will break them out. Amen. God is the one who calms the seas and waves. Psalm 65, verse 7, speaks of God. I love this. Which stilleth the noise of the seas and the noise of their waves and the tumult of the people. You just meditate on that one scripture right there alone in this story in the New Testament. Amen. As the disciples aboard the ill-fated boat marveled at the great calm, it is not hard for us to imagine them saying, what manner of man is this that even the winds and sea obey him? Matthew 8 and 27. They knew this calm was a wonder only God himself could work. Amen. Psalm 65 identifies God three times as Elohim in verses number one, five, and nine. Amen. We even read brilliant flashes of messianic hope in verses two, three, and five. O thou that heareth prayers, unto thee shall all flesh come. Iniquities prevail against me, as for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. Again, all of these things, when you look at the ministry of Jesus, how could you not see that was him? Amen. By terrible things. And this word terrible, 
the word terrible, when you see it in Psalms, it is not the word that we use. When we use the word terrible, it means something bad. But in the Bible's definition, in their times, the word terrible means something just awesome, uh, God mighty. So it means, you know, when you see that word terrible in the book of Psalms, it's talking about, wow, look at what the Lord has done. Amen. So by these God awesome things in righteousness, wilt thou answer us? O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of them that are, are far off upon the seas. Amen. You know, as I was reading this, of course, you know, it, it took me back to some of my Navy days. And uh, most notably, uh, when Hugo came through and I, I was on a ship that was stationed out of Charleston, but when when the storm first started, my ship, we were down in Mayport, Florida. And so when they initially start, you know how they do those weather tracks. And, and they, early on, they, they were saying, well, it's going to come and tear up Florida. And so we were out. My ship was in Florida. We were in shore uh, for a little bit before we get back out to sea. And so I called my wife. Uh, one was a little old bitty something then. So I said, hey. Why don't you uh, just make a road trip to Atlanta? Because I said, worst case, it's going to be some bad thunderstorms, and that way you ain't got to worry about him, you know, hearing all the thunder and lightning. So, again, at the time, we're thinking it's going to hit Florida. But, of course, as you get closer and closer, hey, well, we, we, they're updating it. No, it's going to go a little bit further up the coast and hit South Carolina. And so um, so I'd already given them instructions. They're gone. They, they're about to get on the road. And so um, my captain, uh, so, so what the, the, com the uh, commander over the squadron, so his main focus was I got to get these ships out of here. And so they forgot about us. And so, uh, so he's sorting, getting all the ships out, trying to figure out how not to lose the, the, the uh, nation's money, and they forgot about us. Well, my captain comes up with this brilliant idea uh, so he thought, <laughs> he said, well, since they haven't called us, what we're going to do is we're going to ride in behind the hurricane and be the first ones in port. I'm going to tell you by experience, the only thing worse than being in the front of a hurricane is being right behind a hurricane. I don't know what made him think that was a good idea, <laughs> but I can tell you. That was a rough ride, rough ride, amen. Uh, some sailors who had never <laughs> lost their cookies on the ship were losing their cookies. <laughs> so it tells you how rough it was. So it, it was rough. And then when we get we get to the mouth mouth of the Cooper River, and all of a sudden he realizes, oh, I now have a navigational aid and I got pushed all over the place, huh? Yeah, that might not be a good idea. <laughs> so those storms are rough. And, and, and believe it or not, even during that time, I wasn't a definitely saved Christian like I am now. But uh, that storm made us pray. <laughs> Storms will make sense. Uh, I don't care. You can call yourself atheist, agnostic. You're going to pray to somebody you get caught in a storm like that. Hey Amen. <laughs> You're going to call on him then. Hey Amen. Only God steals the noise of the seas and waves. Wonderfully, when we cross into the New Testament, Jesus steals the noise of seas and waves. The book of Psalms and the Gospels sing a duet of the divinity of Jesus Christ as God himself in human flesh. I would trust God to calm the storms in my life. Storms in our lives look different than they did for the disciples. Their storm in Matthew 8 was an actual storm. Wind, waves, rain, thunder, lightning. Certainly, we have thunderstorms. But, and just bringing it to our modern time, we have a lot better inventions to help us than they had during their time. But we also have storm shelters, umbrellas, windshield wipers, and sandbags to stave off the storm's effects. 
But windshield wipers cannot stave off terminal disease or a divorce notice or a foreclosure notice or a terminal uh, termination. You're losing your job notice. Amen. Or a policeman and a chaplain on our doorstep at 3 a.m. to deliver devastating news. Amen. We call those the storms of life. And every one of us is going to experience something along that line that knocks the breath out of you. Amen. We roll through these storms in our lives, but just as God stilled the storms for the psalmist, he still steals our storms. Even if you hear the roaring waves and feel the stinging rain, ask God to steal the storm in your heart. Amen. So sometimes the storm ain't going to go away, but God gives us peace in the midst of the storm. Amen. God can, but he, if he does not steal the storm altogether, there it is, he can give us peace through it. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither be afraid. God still steals storms. Amen. The Old Testament meets the New Testament. Calming the sea is only in God's job description. Many fishermen and sailors have cursed the wind and waves, hoping to calm them to a sure, safe passage. But no matter how fervent or sincere their best efforts could not dry a single raindrop. However, when God speaks, creation listens. Perhaps this is why the disciples were in awe of Jesus, because they had wished away the waves in times past, but the waves kept crashing. And when Jesus spoke, the sea was as still as glass. I was uh, also meditating. I thought about uh, everybody seen Forrest Gump, one of my wife's favorite movies. I don't know how many times she didn't see that movie. But y'all remember the, uh, Lieutenant Dan who lost his legs and he challenged Forrest Gump. He's Forrest Gump, if you become a boat captain, I'll be your second mate. And of course, y'all know Forrest Gump gets the little shrimp boat. <laughs> and he's on that shrimp boat and they in a storm and he is cursing God for, every, you know, just mad. He's mad about the loss of his legs and everything, how his life's turned out. Amen. But all that fussing at God didn't change anything in that moment. But later, the storm did subside. Amen. The storm's fury and the disciples' fear. Let's go back to the day Jesus stilled the storm to watch it unfold. Jesus had just set sail aboard a boat with his dozen disciples. These weren't the seven seas, but the Sea of Galilee was unforgiving. At any minute, without warning, the warm air from the water danced with the cold air from the mountains and produced an instant hurricane. But this night, all was calm, all was bright. A handful of disciples were fishermen, so they knew their way around the water. But without warning, they spiraled from a calm cruise to rowing for their lives in minutes. Perhaps the reverent quiet of the synagogue they had heard the rabbi read of the noise of the seas and of their ways recorded in the 65th psalm but now they were living it the disciples worked their rescue mission but they were none safer after all attempts to save themselves proved futile the disciples staggered to find jesus somehow sleeping the rigors of ministry uh, ministering to hurting humanity the day before had left Jesus exhausted. They woke him with a stark and startling question. Master, carest thou not that we perish? Mark 4 and 38. Now remember, Jesus was asleep. But in Matthew's account, uh, Matthew 8, remember that day the day before they got on the boat he he was ministering his ministry was at the peak and so in Matthew 8 in the earlier parts of the chapter a leper came to him uh, worshiping him and he said Lord heal me and Jesus healed the leper after the leper came then the centurion came Lord my servant is at a point of death will you heal him Jesus healed that one, amen. And uh, then 
uh, they went to Peter's mother-in-law's home. She was almost deathly ill with a bad fever. Of course, one of his closest disciples, he healed Peter's mother-in-law. And look, look what the scripture, all of this he's doing in one day. Verse uh, 16, it says, And when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and heal all, all right? He's casting out the devils of many, and he healed all that were sick. All this is going on in like a day, all right? That it might be fulfilled was uh, spoken by the prophet Isaiah, the, uh, saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. And when Jesus saw the great multitudes, he gave commandments, and so, by now, he's physically, the human part of him is wore out after all of this ministry. And, and the Bible says the disciples took him as he was. He was wore out. <laughs> they, they basically took him almost passed out, put him in the boat, and that's why he was in such a deep sleep. Amen? All right? So, so that, that builds a framework. And so after all of that ministering, he's trying to get a little bit of rest, and they wake him up saying, Master, don't you care that we're about to perish? Now remember, the first thing he told them was, let us go to the other side. <laughs> all right? When he said, let us go to the other side, is, is, is there any way they're not going to make it to the other side? There's, they're going to make it to the other side. That's what he was hoping they would have remembered. But no, Lord, you don't care? We're about to die? Panic. And, 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 and again, when they had these moments, he would say, how is it that you have no faith? Amen? How is it that we have no faith? Jesus' authority over nature. Jesus did care. Amen? He was on the boat with them. All right, he was on the boat, and and as as I was meditating on it, how many times did I remember uh, when she was Pastor Adams, a bishop about preaching message? Is he on the boat with you? She would make that exhortation. You've got Jesus on. If he's on the boat with you, go through. Hey Amen. It's still the same. If we have His Spirit on the inside, we should be able to weather any storm that life brings to us. Certainly those of us that have been walking with the Lord for some time. Hey Amen. He's looking for us to know how to get through this thing, okay? Jesus fully appreciated the danger they perceived they were in. However, he knew what they did not. He knew he could speak a simple sentence and calm the storm. As far as we know from the biblical history, this miracle had, was never had never happened before. Jesus used nature in the Old Testament to do his work. Uh, God, uh, God used nature in the Old Testament. We discovered last week that God may have called on the weather to help deliver his people out of the Egyptian bondage. God discomfited the Philistines with thunder in, during one battle. The stars and the river fought against Sisera and his army in the days of the judges during another battle. Can reference those 1 Samuel 7 and Judges 5. Amen. God had proven he can send the storm, but the disciples had never heard a story where he stilled the storm. Amen. Novelist Charles Dudley Warner quipped that everyone talks about the weather, but nobody ever does anything about it. <laughs> Jesus woke the pleas of his faithless father followers and did not uh, just speak about the weather. He spoke to the weather. Peace was his first command. Then be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Mark 439. This was no minor miracle. And, um, Jesus just spoke to a raging tempest in the middle of the night while he and his followers were in a fishing boat in the middle of the dark sea of Galilee and he calmed the storm amen i will trust jesus with my storms 
for Florida residents, 2004 was known as the year of the hurricane. Four hurricanes struck the Sunshine State in one year. Hurricane Charlie was the first named storm to make landfall that year. Uh, the young couple had just brought their house in 2003, brand new, ain't even a good year old, and were doing their best to keep it intact through their first hurricane. As the storm swirled outside, they heard shingles flying off the roof. They didn't know what to do. They were afraid, they were afraid to do anything, but they were more afraid to do nothing. The husband went to the patio door and held his ear up to the wall of glass to see if he could hear how intense the rain and winds were growing. The door was shaking in its track. After, after the outer bands of the hurricane passed overhead, the eye of the storm was directly over them. While there, was, uh, while there is a temporary calm, the worst is yet to come. The tail of a hurricane stings more than its head. This time, it surely stung. So that makes sense when I tell you riding behind a hurricane, I believe, is worse than being in the front. And uh, I don't know if y'all ever saw, saw the movie The Perfect Storm. That, that was a good movie. And, and, and it got to where in the middle, everything calmed down. And some of the little less seasoned sailors thought, oh, did we make it through? He says, no, we're just in the eye of it. <laughs> he knew the worst was about to come. And uh, so tricky things about storms there, you know, even sometimes the storms in life. Sometimes we'll get a little bit of a reprieve and we think, oh, great. Maybe this thing is over. And then all of a sudden, a few days later, ah, it ain't. You just passed through the, the eye of the storm. Still got to get through the backside of it. I've been, anybody ever been there? I felt like you get a little reprieve. I thought my body, I was going through something in my body. I'm like, okay, all right. Oh, it ain't bothering me today. Thinking it's good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All of a sudden, like the devil, I'm back. <laughs> anybody ever had any of those? <laughs> Uh, it's, it's like that sometimes. You just keep on praying. <laughs> Amen. It was terrifying for the couple to sit through a storm inside a 1,071 square foot house. It would have been paralyzing to sit through a storm inside a 30 foot fishing boat on the water in the middle of the night. So, yeah, the, the yes, being on a fishing boat out in the sea is going to be far worse and scarier. As the boat tossed and listed, the disciples thought they were as good as gone, but Jesus was on board the boat, and he calmed their storm. Doubtless, life storms are terrifying, but our comfort is that Jesus is with us. He is well able to calm every tempest. He is also well able to calm every fear. Sometimes he calms one or the other. Sometimes he calms both, but at all times he is in control and we can trust him in our storms. Hey man, I was um, listening to the little the uh, thirty-one day prayer this morning, and and, and the fellow who was facilitating he did a little mini teaching, and he talked about the reason we don't hear God sometime is because we've got him. He's inside of us. The reason why it doesn't sound like he's answering our prayers is because we've got him. He's inside of us. So we, we have to remember that, amen. Don't, don't let any circumstances shake your faith, amen, because that's what it's all about, amen, letting your faith take you through whatever life gives, amen. After the storm, Jesus' rebuke and the disciples' response. In nearly the same breath that Jesus rebuked the wind, he rebuked his fellow seafarers in the boat with him. Jesus asked them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? In Mark's gospel, the disciples had already witnessed Jesus deliver a, a demoniac in Capernaum, heal Peter's mother-in-law of a fatal fever, touch a leper, and I talked about those, and heal him, heal and forgive a paralytic who was lowered through a roof and restore man's withered hand, while they were in all that Jesus could heal others, they were not sure he cared about them enough to save their lives. Don't y'all see the irony in that? You're his chosen. 
out of all the people that lived in the earth, he chose you. And, you, and he told you, we're going to the other side. And y'all think he's going to let you die in a storm. <laughs> On the back side of it, it does look wow. And, and, and it's much the same for us sometimes. Once we get through a trial of life, we're going, and the Lord kind of ministers something to you. It's like, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. <laughs> I got to repent. I'm I should have known you delivered me through something worse years ago. So why was I acting so shaky here? And, and, and if we're that shaky, guess what? That means we're going to probably have to take that test again. So it's best to get on through it, pass that quiz the first time, and be done with it. Amen? They looked at one, one another and asked a telling question that indicates they still did not understand who Jesus was. And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? He was your creator, the one who created all of that. Amen. That's, uh, amazingly, this is Matthew 8. This pastor just recently did a good teaching of uh, ministering to us on uh, Matthew 18. When Peter asked, the, when, when they asked the questions, who, who do y'all say that I am? They should have referred back to them. You got to be God. <laughs> After what we saw you do, but it only seemed like Peter had the revelation. Amen. Their question betrayed their misunderstood theology. They thought Jesus was just a man who had come to do a work for God. They had his mission turned around. He was God who had come in hum human flesh to do a work to save humanity. He saved the disciples from their storm, and later he saved them from their sins. Saints, we're, we're in a beautiful position to be able to read the Bible on the backside of this. They, they, were, go they were living this stuff. The, the, the New Testament hadn't been penned yet, so they were kind of going through it. <laughs> yeah. Brother Gary got that look on his face like, wow, can you imagine that? Uh, they, this hadn't been penned yet. They were living in it. He only told them when they got to be much older disciples. Now go back and write what y'all remembered me doing. Hey, Amen. So a lot of times we're blessed to be reading the whole. We got 66 books of God's awesome works throughout all ages. Hey, Amen. And still, sometimes we get a little shaky, even in our storms. Hey, Amen. Yes, sir. Come on. Mm. Praise the Lord, Saint. When we get when we get ourselves in a situation, a lot of times when we ain't thinking, panic set in. Mm -hmm. We have got to get a hold of the panic. A amen. Right then. Amen. Over experience, I, when I first got saved, something hit me. I get shaken. <laughs> but when I see the spirit of fear coming, I stop that thing right then. Amen. Before my imagination get carried away with me. Amen. <laughs> And situations get too big for me to handle. Amen. I think God can handle it. Hold up, devil. Amen. I know who I have believed in. Hallelujah. Amen. This, this lesson is an example for us. That when we ever have a storm, mm -hmm. first thing we don't need to do is panic. Amen. Because when you panic, you can forget it. Amen. It's a wonderful tip. Oh, get your Amen. Little wonder the scripture says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. Exactly what he's saying. Grab a hold of it. Amen. Grab a hold of it. No, 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 no. And sometimes if you look at the situation, that's what's causing the fear. Don't look at the situation. Remember another storm they had when Jesus came walking on the water. And Peter goes, Lord, if it's you. Invite me out there. Bid me to come. Jesus said one word, come. And Peter was doing good until he started, ooh, this wind is blowing. Ooh, and start. See, once he took his eyes off Jesus, then all of a sudden fear captured him. But while he had his eyes on the Lord, he was walking good, defying nature. 
And that's what we have to do. Don't look at all the circumstances and their elements and the symptoms. Set your focus on Jesus. It's easier said than done. But if we've been in this thing for a while, sometimes you got to look at, oh, yeah, I had a worse situation. Man, one time I, I lost my job. And I ain't know how I, it was going to work out. But while I was trying to figure it out, the Lord worked that thing out. And so some of these other little things, well, man, he can bring me through that. He brought me through that. He certainly can bring me through this. Amen. I will worship Jesus as Lord. Although none of the gospel writers tell us how the disciples responded once the boat hit the beach, two dem demoniacs appeared to be untamable aforetime, ran to Jesus and worshiped him. The storm brewing on the Sea of Galilee was just a drizzle compared to the storm brewing within the city limits of uh, Gadira. But Jesus was about to prove he is greater than the devil. On that day, G the disciples had all access passes to witness Jesus calm the storm that threatened two demon-possessed men just as miraculously yet easily as he calmed the storm that threatened them. Jesus truly is Lord and God. And when we see him as such, the only right response is worship. Amen. Can you worship God in the midst of your storm? The Bible, you know, we, we've heard the story of Job. Man lost all his children, all his wealth. But the Bible said in all this, the man didn't charge God foolishly and he worshiped all that he went through he still found an ability to worship God amen and the devil said I'm gonna make him cut curse you he never did he held on to his integrity like, made a devil a liar amen internalizing the message not enough paper exists in all the trees and all forests in the world to write of all the miracles Jesus has worked John stated quote the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. John 21, 25. We will not exhaust in one lesson all the Bible tells us about his miracles. But we have been given a glimpse into seeing Jesus for who he is, the sovereign God, who performs the specific miracle that the Old Testament identifies as something only the Lord can do. He calmed the, storm, uh, the stormy seas, and another miracle, he even walked on water. Made reference to that. We know not all storms are in boats on seas. The writer tells his story. says, when my wife and I learned, much to our surprise, that our family was in crisis, it seemed to me that we came to the end of our rope very quickly. The crisis involved the dissolution of the marriage of one of our children. We did everything we could to think of to try to intervene so that divorce would be avoided. Uh, nothing seemed to help. Tensions developed not only between us and our in-laws, but between us and our parents. The storm raged with ever-increasing fury. It seemed to me that my ministry had come to an end. Since our family was falling apart, what credibility would I have left? Who would want to listen to anything I had to say? As I sat in our home one Saturday afternoon, the phone rang. I didn't recognize the caller's voice. He identified himself. He was calling from about 2,000 miles away. I did not know him. He said God had awakened him during the night, about two weeks before his call, and strongly impressed my name upon him. God had given him two verses of scriptures for me. Here is the first one. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Isaiah 43, 2. I think I had those in my notes. My last message, I just ministered for communion. I don't think I got to, to that one, but it was in my notes. I was blown away when I saw this in the lesson. Amen. I was amazed. As a student of scripture, I realized Isaiah wrote these words to Israel, but it seemed they perfectly described my situation. But there was a second verse. 
Here it is. But Israel shall be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed or disgraced forever and ever. Isaiah 45, 17. If God loves Israel, he loves me and you. Regardless of the kind of storm we face, he is able to speak peace. The sea may not be named Galilee, but when the waters calm, their response will be much like that of the disciples of Jesus. I marveled at that phone call and those scriptures. So should we. Amen. Awesome. Again, Jesus calms the storms. Amen. He calms all storms, no matter what they are. Remember, saints, we are a blessed people. John writes in his Gospels, he says, we were not born of the will of uh, our parents, but we were born because God had a purpose for us in the earth. Amen. What, what he desires is that we get to a place, amen, as his saints or disciples, amen, followers of Christ, that we can weather through any storms. The thing that amazed me when I first came to this church, and, uh, I, I, you know, we used to have those testimony services, and, man, saints were getting up, and I was like, wow, they have some amazing faith. And so I'm a babe in the Lord, so I start praying, God, I want some faith like the saints. Uh, praying at the house, I want some faith like the saints. But trials kept coming. Trials kept on coming. And, I, and uh, it, 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 he was Elder Morris at the time. And I ain't told nobody what I've been praying, not even my wife. He was up here ministering the word. He didn't, only got it from God. He said, he, like he looked me square now. He said, you keep God asking God for faith. He's going to keep sending trials. And I was like, oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> but guess what? God got us through it, and what was stronger? My faith. Amen. So it's part of the process. Amen. The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. A man, a preacher, um, once said, he says, the same energy it takes for you to walk away from God when you're going through a storm, the same energy if you decide to go backwards or backslide or do whatever because you're tired of it, is the same energy as it takes to go forward with him through the storm. So if it's the same energy, why not stay with God and go on through it? Amen? That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Stay with God and go through whatever life brings to you. Amen. Jesus calms the storms. Amen. No matter what we face in life, remember we have a God who does care. That's what it said in this lesson. He does care. Amen. He does care. The beautiful thing about this story is um, he was sleeping in that boat because of all of the ministry. His human part got tired. Amen. But the reality of the God, the one that sent us the Holy Ghost, the psalmist writes, he never sleeps, nor does he slumber. So he ain't never going to be asleep. You can call him up at any time in the midnight hour going through your storm. He's not going to be asleep. Amen. And, and the writer of Hebrews says he was in all points tempted and tested just like we are. But yet he was without sin. Amen. So just know, no matter what, we don't have to sin. We don't have to quit. We don't have to do anything. Make it through your storm. Amen. And likewise, you got a brother or sister somewhere in Christ that's going through the same thing. Somewhere. Somebody's going through the exact same thing. Now, if they've made up their mind, they can make it. Make up your mind. I can make it too. Amen. Amen. We hope you got something out of the Sunday school lesson. Amen. Amen. We're going to, amen. Amen. Let's go into a brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, in your name, God, we thank you. We do thank you for being the God who calms the storms. 
you calm natural storms as well as situational storms that come up in all of the lives of your people. And God, not only for us, sometimes you even do it for the sinner man, hallelujah. But we thank you for being that kind of God, caring and loving. Lord, we ask that you have your way in the service this morning. God, we desire to feel your presence. Oh, God, have your way in our midst. We give your name praise, honor, and glory because it belongs to you and you only. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. For this is a day the Lord has made. We are come to rejoice. We come to lift up and bring up the name of Jesus. Hosanna. Hosanna. So we just invite everybody out in the name of Jesus to come join in with us as we lift up the name of God because he's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. <laughs> to say oh magnify the lord for he is worthy to be praised oh magnify the lord for he is worthy to be praised Hosanna Blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation, Hosanna, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation, oh, magnify the Lord, for he Blessed be the rock of my salvation, Hosanna, oh, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation, come and worship now and now, for he is worthy to be praised. Worship and bow down, for he is worthy to be praised. Hosanna, oh, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna, oh, blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Come, bow down, down, for He is worthy to be praised. Come, let's worship and bow down, for He is worthy to be praised. Blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation, Hosanna, oh, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation, oh, magnify the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. By the Lord, for He is worthy to be praised. Hosanna, oh, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna, oh, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation. 
Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna. Oh, blessed be the rock. 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 Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Oh, bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Come on and bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Oh, no. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, yes, God. Hallelujah. He's welcome in this house on today. Yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus.
Welcome God. Let's welcome God. Come on, hallelujah. Stand to your feet. Let's, let's welcome God. Hallelujah. Welcome in your house. Welcome him in this house. But whatever you do, just welcome God. Welcome God. Oh, come on, somebody. Let's welcome God. We got the breakthrough in time. Come on, God. Whatever it is, breakthrough. Come on, Papa. Welcome Him. Welcome Him. As we welcome the man of God, hallelujah, welcome God, hallelujah. Come on and praise him. Come on and praise him. Come on and give him praise. He's worthy of the honor. He's worthy of the glory. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on and give him praise. He's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy. Hallelujah. While you're yet standing and giving God praise and loving home God, go ahead and grab five people. Let them know, hallelujah, that you're just glad to see them in the house. You're glad to see them, hallelujah, at the church of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Let them know that not only does God love them, you love them too. Hallelujah. Let them know that through it all, you're here on today. Hallelujah. Whatever you had to go through you here on today hallelujah every mountain that was climbed every valley that you went through you are here on today hallelujah hallelujah we serve an awesome God we serve an awesome God we serve an awesome God hallelujah hallelujah we serve an awesome God hallelujah 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 glory be to God glory be to God Hallelujah, hallelujah. Welcome in this place. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Have your way, have your way. Move as only you can move. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory be to God. We serve a great God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Anybody just feel good on today? Hallelujah. Anybody just feel good on today? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Is there a hallelujah in the house? Hallelujah. Is there a thank you, Jesus, in the house? Is there a Lord, I love you in the house? Ha Lord, I need you in the house. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. I'm looking at Mother Ginyard. All I can do is just smile. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on and clap your hands and give God praise. Glory be to God. Hallelujah, glory, glory, glory. Mm, we serve an awesome God. We, I feel like, I feel like running. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hey, good God in the morning time. Hallelujah. Woo, I feel like running. Woo, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Mm, glory, Lord, I love you. Hey, Lord, I love you. Woo, glory be to God. Mm, glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Woo, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hey! Woo! My, 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 my. Glory, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm, hallelujah. Woo! There's a mm, sweet spirit of Jesus in this place. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, glory, glory, glory. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Mm, we give honor to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, who is ahead of our life. 
Hallelujah. We know he's in this place. Hallelujah. How you know? Because I can, I can feel him moving. Hallelujah. On the altar of my heart. Hey, glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Mm, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, when I think of the goodness of Jesus oh, and all he's done for me, mm, my soul cries out, hallelujah. I thank God. Hey, man, I know he's good to you. Oh, but I thank God. Oh, he's been good to me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm, glory be to God. Mm, hallelujah. We give honor, amen, to our great pastor. Amen. Pastor, amen. Gary Jones, God bless you. We give honor. We thank you, Lord. We thank God for you. Mm, we love you on today. Amen. We give honor, amen, to Lady Jones. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. The ministerial staff as a whole, Elder Gibbert, Elder Ray, Minister Miles, Minister Jacobs. Amen. The wives of, amen, the ministers, the deacons and their wives. I'm looking at Deacon. I'm looking at Deacon Patterson. Mother, you did it again. You did it again. <laughs> amen. We certainly thank God, amen, for the mothers of the church. Amen. Again, it's good to see, amen, Mother Ginyar. Amen. Back in the house. Amen. And all, if there be any visitors, we thank God for you. Amen. Hallelujah. If there is not any visitors, we thank God for family. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And I certainly thank God, amen, for my, my BFF, my WIFE, my, amen, just mine. Amen. My wife, amen, Sister Whiteside. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. We do have the word on today. Amen. We're going to invite you, amen, to 2 Samuel, the 24th chapter. 2 Samuel, the 24th chapter. Amen. And we'll begin reading at verse number one. We're going to jump around. Amen. But we're going to stay as far as our reading. Amen. In this chapter. 2 Samuel. Twenty-four. Are we there? Amen. amen. The Bible speaks, amen, on this wise, Second Samuel uh, twenty-four, uh, chapter. 24, verse number one. Amen. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. For the king said to Joab, the captain of the host, which it was with him, go now through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, and number ye the people, that I may know the number of the people. And Joab said unto the king, Now the Lord thy God add unto the people how many soever they be, an hundredfold, and that the eyes of my Lord the king may see it. But why doth my Lord the king delight in this thing? Notwithstanding the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the host, and Joab and the captains of the host went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. Go with me down to verse number eight. So when they had gone through all the land and came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days, nine months, amen, is how long a woman is to carry a child. Is that not right? Mm-hmm. And Joab gave up the sum of the number of people to the king, and there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men that drew the sword. And there, and the, and the men of Judah were 500,000 men. 
And David's heart smote after he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have in what in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. For when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. And so Gad came unto David and told him and said unto him, Seven years of famine come unto thee uh, in thy land. Or wilt thou flee three months before uh, thine enemies while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in thy land? Now advise and see what answer I will return to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. And let not and let me not fall into the hand of man. And so the Lord sent the pestilence, uh, sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even unto the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba seventy thousand men. By the grace of God, I want to be before you under the topic in the hand of the Lord. In the hand of the Lord. Father, bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And while you're taking a seat, come on and give honor, amen, to the founder, amen, of the church of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 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 <clears throat> Glory be to God. Amen. 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 In the hand of the Lord. We understand David, a man, the king of Israel, was one that was picked, a man, because he was a man that was after the very own heart of God. It was David that was overlooked even by his own father, but yet God did not overlook him. And while he was tending the sheep, a man of his father, I believe that David was learning how to be a man, a great shepherd, how to be a great leader. It was David, the Bible lets us to know that when he went to check on his brothers, that there a man was almost a war between the Philistines, a man in the army of Israel. It was the Philistines that was talking all the junk in Israel. And even with their king, Saul was intimidated. It was David that looked at a man, Goliath, and told them that I can kill a man, this, this, this giant. I can, I, 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 I know how a man to fight. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a lion and a bear that came and took a man, one of the sheep. And when I went out to get it, a man, because a man, the bear raised up on me, I grabbed him by his beard and I slew him. And just like that bear died, I, I can kill a man, this, this giant. And we understand it was David that got a man the victory. And while he was doing and carrying himself, a man throughout the kingdom and throughout a man the palace. It was those individuals that began to take a look at David and saw a man how he carried himself and heard how when he went out to war that it was him that was very a man victorious. It was David that everything that he did, amen, he did it in the name of Jesus. The song came, a man, by the women that said, David killed a man man I mean, Saul killed his thousands but David killed a man his ten thousands and Saul a man we understand began to get jealous at that time we understand 
that during this time it was Saul that was chasing a man David because he wanted to kill him because a man of jealousy but David knew that his hand or his life a man was in the hand of God and when he became king it was David a man that uh, that understood the things that he was supposed to do a man as a man a king but there was a time a man the Bible says that the time of war that when a man the kings went out a man unto battle that it was David that got a lazy spirit and stayed home it was David that was supposed to go before his a man army and show them just how a man to fight show them a man that I am a man of war show them that I am a man of bravery but David allowed that spirit of laziness a man to overtake take him and we all understand that when you in the wrong place at the wrong time things are bound a man uh, to happen the bible says that he woke up early one night and a man began to go out on the roof and and look and saw that there was a woman that was bathing herself and even after he a man inquired of this woman and finding out that she was the wife a man of a man Uriah that did not stop him a man from going and wanting to be a man with this a man woman and we understand a man how the bible says in james the first a man chapter that is something that happens a man during this time that when a man is tempted that he should not say that he's tempted of god because god does not tempt a man uh, with evil and then a man when he is drawn away he's drawn away from the lust that is inside him the lust and enticed but we understand that there's something that happens a man when these things are conceived that it brings about sin and after sin it brings a man death and so when we look at this story it was David that allowed his flesh to override a man the thing that he knew to do right and we all understand a man how it was David after he was with a man Bathsheba and she began or she became pregnant how he began to meditate or premeditate if you will a way that he could get rid of a man Uriah he came and invited Uriah back and gave him all kinds of meat and drink thinking that if he could get him out of his mind if he could get him drunk that he would amen go and be with his wife amen but even though Uriah was there he slept at the door a man of his house and said a man that my brothers are out in the field at war so why a man should I go in and enjoy myself David then at that time came up with another plan and pinned a man the very murder of Uriah and gave it to Uriah to carry the letter that was going to kill him and so not only was David an adulterer he was also a man a murderer and we thank God for Nathan a man that had enough about him to come to David and tell David of a story that there was a man that was rich and there was a man that only had a one little ewe lamb and he treated this ewe lamb as a family member as a matter of fact the ewe lamb would eat at the table and there a man the rich man got a visitor and instead of slewing one of his ewe lambs he he took the only lamb that this poor man had and slew it and, and they ate and it was David a man that began to get a man angry and said surely this man shall die good God in the morning it was Uriah that said that you are a man the man and even though a man the Bible says that David was a man after the very heart of God when you search the scriptures it was also David that repented about six or seven times he repented a man when this a man was brought to him it was David that said I have surely sinned against God and then it was Nathan that said that go 
God took away uh, your sin. And no, it didn't say uh, in the scripture that David repented. But you and I know that the only way uh, that God will forgive us of our sins uh, is that we have to repent. David understood a man uh, that he was not in the right place uh, or nor was he in the right in the will of God uh, and said against God God have I sinned. When we look at Psalms 41, we see uh, David said that I've sinned and asked a man for forgiveness. He penned Psalms uh, 51 because of this action with Uriah, a man, and Bathsheba. And here, a man, in the 24th chapter of 2 Samuel, we see that he has, a man, a repentant heart after, a man, God, a man, had turned his heart. Uh, so it was David, a man, that had a, a, a sin or committed a sin uh, a man that was because of the flesh uh, and even when he numbered the people uh, we understand that this was also a sin uh, but it wasn't a sin uh, of the flesh it was a sin of a man the spirit uh, when we look at second Corinthians the seventh chapter a man verse number one the Bible says having therefore these promises dearly beloved let us cleanse our Sales from all, uh, amen, filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, uh, perfecting holiness in the fear, uh, amen, of God. Uh, so that tells us that not only do we have to watch our flesh, uh, we also have to guard our spirit. Uh, we got to have the right spirit uh, to be in the will of God. Uh, it was David, amen, when he, amen, uh, decided to do something, uh, amen, that did not have to be done and was not under the direction of God. He had a man of sin of the spirit. And it was David that said that this is a great sin. You would think a man because a man of the adultery, a man that he committed, a man with a man of Bathsheba, that that sin would be greater than the sin, a man of numbering the people. But when we look at the sin with a man, Bathsheba, the sin of the flesh, when he was drawn away, when he was enticed, we look at it, he did have some death. The unborn baby was died. His sons, four of his sons died. It was Ammon that died because of this sin. It was Absalom that died. It was Adonijah, a man that died as well. A man as Uriah. It was five people that died because of the sin that David committed a man with Bathsheba. And when we even look at this, and we look at the Bible, and we can really compare the Bible along with the civil, a man judicial system. The Bible says in the 19th chapter of Deuteronomy, if two friends go out, or a neighbors, if you will, go out and they, amen, go into the forest and they begin to chop down wood. If the head of the axe comes off and accidentally kills his neighbor, one whom he loves, no hate, then he can go to one of the three cities, amen, that I have designed because of the increase that you're going to have. It's going to be so far away that if the person who a man wants to avenge uh, of the one that was dead, his blood, by the time he gets there, he'll cool down in his heart. God. God knows how to do it. Then he also says this. If there's one that lie in wait to kill his neighbor because he hates him and he flees to these three cities, then you go and get him, bring him back and you will kill him because I will not have innocent blood, a man with guilt. In other words, he was saying, uh, we have a man, a system that if something is done out of passion or something is done that is premeditated, we can take care of that. But if something is done accidentally, we can also take care of that. And we 
know crimes of passion. Uh, crimes of passion happens instantly. Uh, and it's those only only those people, uh, amen, that are involved at that time. Uh, in other words, if you will, let me use this. Uh, give me license to, uh, uh, to say uh, uh, something that we don't do. Uh, if a man were to go home uh, and find his wife with another man uh, and shot both of them, pow, pow. Then, amen, that is considered a crime of passion. But if that man were to leave and go and kill another woman that looked like his wife, that is not a crime of passion. And if this same man were to let them live, go out and wait a week and allow it to muster and then go and kill a man, his wife, or a man the man that is not considered a crime of passion and so a man just like a man it is a man or was in the biblical days we have the same types of laws but now David is no more sinning with the flesh he is now sinning a man with his spirit David a man the Bible says a man moved against Israel because the anger of God was kindled against them. We don't know why, amen, God was angry with Israel. There are those theologians that believe they were angry with Israel because they did not willingly accept David, amen, to be their king. And it was still there because of the attitude of those that were in the kingdom. And now David, a man, moves against them by allowing something that was already in him to come out of him. It, a man, is written, hallelujah, in Chronicles that Satan, a man, tempted a man, David. But a man in Samuel says that God moved David. And so we understand that a man cannot be tempted by God. God does not tempt us. He tests us. Good God. A test, a man, is to give us a chance to see what's down on the inside of us. It's just a test so we can see what we may need to get out. Testing does not, a man, bring us to a place of death, but it is the will of the devil a man to tip us to get us out of the will of God. The Bible says that a man that Satan is the father of lies and he is the accuser of the brethren. As a matter of fact when we look at it he tempts more than he lies because he understands who he's talking to. If, the, if, if, the, if Satan understands if I can tempt them I can bring them out of the will of God. I don't have to lie on them. If I can just tempt them to do something that is not pleasing unto God. But God says let me test them so they can see what's down on the inside of us. You remember the story how it was God that said have you considered my servant Job? It wasn't Satan that went to God and said that I want to do this to Satan. But it was God, amen, that gave Satan permission to see so the devil could see what's down on the inside of Job. This test that you're going through is not to break you. It's not to discourage you. It's just for you to see what's down on the inside of you. You ought to clap your hands and tell God thank you. The Bible says 
that David, amen, asked Joab, go and number, amen, to see what, is the, what the number is. Now, numbering, amen, within itself was not a sin because, amen, they had to number them in the book of Numbers and also in the book of Exodus so that when, amen, it was time for taxes, they could get the half a shekel, amen, and know I have this amount of people and I should receive this amount of money. So numbering within itself, amen, was not a sin. Even in the same book, in the 18th chapter, I believe, it was David that numbered them and put captains over them. But now, hallelujah, after David had a man experience, victory after victory, something was down on the inside of David. Some say that he did it because he wanted to get a man a tribune for himself. But this had never been done. Some say he was doing it because he wanted to see just how many people that he had under him. And then there are those that say he did it because of the covenant that a man God had with Abraham. Your seed shall be as the sand of a man the beach. But I believe that he did it because it was something down that caused him to look at himself in the manner in which God would not have him to see himself. Yes, David, I understand. You did kill Goliath. And I understand that you killed all kinds of Philistines. And every victory that you did, if you recall in your mind, you went in the name of Jesus. You didn't go in your own name. Because your name has no power. But the name of Jesus, it has power. The name of Jesus is higher than every other name. Come on and clap your hands and tell God thank you. Even when Joab got the assignment, he was trying, can I back up? No, no. We understand that when we have pride, pride is something that makes everybody sick around us but the individual that has pride. And when you think about it and you meditate on that spirit of pride, pride is the result of all sin. You can't tell me the things a man that people do outside of the will of God. The root is not because of pride. When we have the word, I'm talking about those in the word, in the body of Christ. Those that in the world, amen, they do what they want to do. But we're governed here by the word of God. So anytime we do something opposite of the word of God, we're being prideful and we're kicking against a man God. Pride will call someone not to have a repentant heart. Pride will call someone to get outside of the will of God and they think that they're in the will of God. The Bible says that there's six things that the Lord hates and seven is an abomination. And new two of the seven is a lying tongue. But the first thing that's named, it is pride. He hates a prideful look. Pride says, yes, pastor, you say do this, but I'm going to do it my way because I got a prideful spirit. Pride, amen, is always followed by destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. It was Joab that said, hold up, David. I hear what you want to do. You want to number them. I got it. But it's God that will give you, amen, a hundreds of hundreds of thousand. Why you want to know how many you have? No, David, I don't think you need to do this. I want to know the number. The Bible says that when they went out, and even after Joab and the elders tried to talk sense, amen, into David, they saw the pride that David had, but David didn't see the pride. Now, 
not only a man is pride, a man the root of sin, it also is the parent, a man that brings forth the sin. Good God in the morning time, David no go out and get the number of people. The Bible says that they did this and while they were doing it, it took nine months and 20 days. And so when Bathsheba was pregnant, David had a chance, a man to repent. Nine months that that woman was with child and he didn't repent until it was brought to his attention. And now it takes them, a man, nine months and 20 days. A man, David, still didn't have a repentant heart. They went down, a man, and through all, a man, the kingdom. But there's two places that they did not number. The tribe of Levi, who was the priest, nor did they go into Benjamin. Because at Benjamin, hallelujah, a man was Gilead, which also had the temple. And I'm of the frame of mind that Joab said, no, no, this land is holy. I'm on a sinful mission, and I refuse to go in holy land. You don't have to do wrong because somebody else wants to do wrong. You make sure you're right in the eyes of God. Come on and clap your hands and tell God thank you. The Bible says that when they came back with the number, it had about one million and three hundred thousand. But then David said in his heart, oh God, I've done something great. I've done something foolishly. Will you forgive me of my iniquity? The Bible says that wow, he was saying this, that the spirit of God moved upon his seer by the name of Gad. Gad is first introduced in the scripture when he was running, hallelujah, a man from Saul. And now he's here again. And it was Gad, hallelujah, that was over a man, the priest. He was one that ensured that the priestly ceremonies would run right. And now here's Gad recording the things of David. And the Spirit of God comes, amen, upon Gad and goes to David and said, Thus saith the Lord, since you made a good God in the morning time, sometimes the punishment of God is to let us do what we want to do. Sometimes he won't stop us. He will allow us to continue to do what we want to do. And that sometimes brings shame. The Bible says that pride bringeth forth shame. And now we have, hallelujah, we have David, a man that is about to get word from God. A man through the prophet of Gad. He said, because you chose this, a man from your heart, you chose to number this because you had something down on the inside of you. God is going to give you a choice, but you've got to choose one. Here in Samuel, it says that seven years of famine. In Chronicles, it says three years. And I believe it's that a man difference because a man, Joab and the elders, did not bring David an accurate number. It's not that the scriptures, a man are confusing or the scriptures a man are contradicting themselves because we know the word of God, a man is God and God cannot contradict a man himself because he is God good God in the morning time the Bible says you have seven years of famine or three months a man where you're running from your enemies or you can have three days a man of pestilence it was David that said in other words I don't want to run from my enemies I don't want to do that I'm a little old now I'm not as agile as good God I know what you mean I'm not as agile as I used to there was a time I could wake up jump out of bed and say good morning Jesus now I got to sit up oh, hear a bunch of cracks Woo! 
Oh, thank you, Jesus. So I know how David felt. David said, I don't want to run from my enemies. I got my wife. I got my family. And I'm good right here. And anyway, if I fall into the hands of man, they don't know how to have mercy. They are, amen, put me down. As long as they put want to put me down, they will kill me. Good God, in the morning time, even though that had my back, they'll try to cut off my neck. I don't want to fall in the hands of man, because they don't have grace and mercy, not to give, but they want to receive. But I'd rather fall into the hands of God, because great is his mercy. Come on and clap your hands and tell God thank you. I know you're saved, sanctified, fire baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost. But every now and again, God has to give us mercy. Mercy because of the things, amen, that we may have thought. Mercy because the things that we have allowed to enter into our heart. Thank God for grace and mercy. Surely they shall follow me along with goodness all the days of my life. I'd rather fall in the hands of God because his mercies are great. They're everlasting. Now, good God, I want you to look at this. He said seven years of famine. And if he chooses seven years of famine, I know he'll give me mercy to make it through. And if he gives me three days of pestilence, I know he'll give me mercy, amen, to make it through. Because the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Come on and clap your hands and tell God thank you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I shall fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy strength. Mm, they comfort me. Come on and clap your hands and tell God thank you. Yet, amen, he slay me. Even though he slays me, yet I will trust him. Come on and clap your hands again and tell God thank you. The Bible says, and I need you to listen to this, that morning God brought the pestilence and then it says to the appointed time now good God we got to look at this the appointed time could have meant amen the three days amen were accomplished because we know whatever God says is going to come to pass but then amen the appointed time was the time of sacrifice which was three o'clock in the afternoon I'm of the frame of mind because a man when you read the scripture it says that David's eyes were opened by God and he saw the angel with his sword extended over Jerusalem and it was God that repented and he said these three things it four things it it three things it is enough stop right there angel no more dying no more plague I'm of the frame of mind because of God's mercy at three o'clock not three days but at three o'clock God looked down on the children of Israel he looked down on David and saw the destruction and said my mercy's great ah, he can't take anymore I'll give him just enough but I never put more on him than he can bear if you're going through it you in the hands of God you can make it down in your valley you in the hands of God you can make it come on and clap your hands and tell God thank you it was hallelujah Gad that went hallelujah amen to David and God Gad uh, told David through God uh, now what you gotta do uh, you gotta go and erect a man uh, man an altar uh, and so the plague if you will uh, will be stayed
stayed. Uh, can I go back and digress? Uh, so if three days, Sister Ashley, uh, was accomplished, uh, why would the angel uh, with his bad self uh, still have the sword uh, a man extended out? Uh, why would God have to tell the angel, uh, enough is enough? Uh, there is no angel in heaven uh, that can go past uh, the will of God. Uh, that's why I say uh, his mercy is great. Uh, and I believe it happened in the morning. Uh, and on that same day uh, at 3 o'clock, uh, he said, that's enough. Uh, the Bible says that God came to him uh, and said, I need you to make an altar. Uh, amen. So the pestilence, if you will, uh, will be stayed from you. Uh, the Bible says that David went on. Uh, and while he was going, uh, hallelujah, uh, he was climbing the mountain. Uh, and you and I got to go higher. Uh, we got to go higher in our way of thinking. Uh, we got to go higher in our way of living. Uh, our prayer life got to be higher. Uh, our studying has got to be higher. Uh, there's a song that says, uh, come on, let's go higher. Uh, how we got to go higher. Uh, but those that want to stay, uh, you let them stay. Uh, we got to go higher uh, so we can see things in God. Uh, see what God want us to see. Uh, go where God uh, wants us to go uh, and do what God uh, will have us to do. Uh, and the only way we can do that, uh, we got to go higher. Uh, the Bible says that he went, uh, a man that saw a threshing floor uh, that was owned by Aaron. Uh, and it was Aaron uh, that when he saw King David, uh, he began to worship a man, the king. Uh, and it was David that said, uh, amen, it was Aaron uh, that said to the king, uh, amen, all hell king. And David said, I need a man to build an altar. And I need to sacrifice. So the plague, a man will stay from us. And it was Aaron that said, you can have the threshing floor. As a matter of fact, you can have this oxen. And the thing that pertain to the oxen, a man to make your sacrifice. And may the Lord hear you. And David said, no, no. I can't just take this free. This is going to cost me something. Uh, I want to pay uh, mm, for the threshing floor. Uh, and when we look at the threshing floor, uh, we understand this was a place that was high. Uh, and the reason that it was high uh, is when they began uh, a man to beat out the wheat, uh, it would be the wind uh, that would blow away. Uh, a man, all the chaff uh, and all the stuff that's not used. Uh, and so, a man, this is also the good God in the morning time. Uh, this was also the same place. Well, it was Abraham that said, y'all stay here. Me and the lad, we're going to go worship. And we're going to return. It was God, hallelujah, that gave Abraham a ram. But he gave David mercy. You ought to clap your hands and tell God, thank you. This is the same place where Solomon built the temple. And so David was saying, no, sir, this is going to cost me. In other words, he was saying, because I did this wicked thing, I don't expect this to be a free thing. But when I go to God, I know it's going to cost me something. The Bible says that he built the altar. He bought it for 50 shekels. Good God in the morning time. And the sign that God gave a man, David, a man that fire came down and consumed the altar. Good God in the morning time. You and I got to have an altar. And the reason we need an altar is we need to put our praise on the altar so we can tell God just how much we love him, just how much we appreciate him, just how much good God. We need him. But we got to be like Abraham. Whatever I put on the altar of God, I want to ensure that God get it. I want him to have my best praise. All I got to do is think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me. All I got to do is think of how God has elevated me. Can I go ahead, Sister Whiteside, and give my testimony 
me. I've been sitting on this thing for a little while. Sometimes when we think we need to get elevated in this area, God, a man will say, no, 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 no. I know what you see, but you don't see the way I see. You don't think the way I think. As a matter of fact, your thoughts are far off from me. You think that position looks good and is for you, but that's not for you. Good God in the morning time, for we walk by faith and not by sight. On my job, Brother D. Gary, I've seen Brother Gary D. I've seen people get elevated, and here I am doing, amen, all that I know to do. Some say I don't say it. Some say, Sister Ray, you're the heartbeat of the schoolhouse. Well, I understand that the body is, you take care of the heart. You do your cardio. You eat right. And when you don't eat right or do your cardio, you're now putting your heart at risk. So if I'm the heartbeat of the schoolhouse, take care of that beat. Good God in the morning time. But now, hallelujah, after year after year, paying tithes on what I want to be. Year after year, I said paying tithes didn't. No, no, giving tithes. Year after year for the position that I want. Along came a phone call. Hey, Brother Whiteside, I need you to fill this application out because I want you to have an interview so you can get this job. It's not where you are, but sometimes it's where you're going. Come on and clap your hands and tell God thank you. When you're in the hand of God, God knows how to hold you. He knows how to lead you. And he knows how to guide you. When you're in the hands of God, he'll give you good and not bad. When you're in the hands of God, he'll open doors that need to be open and close doors that need to be closed. Great is his mercy and his grace is everlasting. Come on and clap your hands and tell God thank you. The devil meant it for the bad, but God turned the thing around. Amen for the good. David did a sin. He saw what was down on the inside and he saw, hallelujah, that it was 70,000 people that died because of David. David began to pray to God. Oh, no, no, no. What about the sheep? They didn't do this thing, but I need you to do give me a man uh, in my house the thing that you've given to Israel. Don't let it fall on them, but let it fall on me. Don't punish them because of my shortcoming, but let it come to me. David knew that no matter what God gives me, his grace and mercy is going to keep me. No matter what you you're going through. You don't let go of mercy. I know it may not feel good, but you don't let go of mercy. It may not even look good, but you don't let go of mercy. And every now and again, you got to remind yourself, he'll never leave me, nor will he forsake me. Come on and clap your hands and tell God, thank you. Mercy says, look up to the hills from which cometh your help. All your help cometh from the Lord. Mercy says, by my stripes you are healed. Mercy says, no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. Mercy says, you above and not beneath. You the lender, not the borrower. You the apple of my eye. Weeping may endure for a night, but mercy is going to bring joy. Come on and clap your hands and tell tell God thank you in the hands of God because great is his mercy he will never put more on us than we can bear he will never put a man evil upon us 
He will never tempt us unto evil. He will test us so we can see what's down on the inside. That's how much he loves us. He loves us, Sister Ray, so much that he says, let me test them so they can see what's on the inside of them. And then he says, let me test them so others can see what's on the inside of them. You said that he'll curse me to my face because of I, what I've given him. And I put an edge of protection around him. But he still hold, held on uh, to his integrity. Uh, he said, the Lord giveth, uh, the Lord taketh away. Uh, blessed be uh, the name of the Lord. Uh, come on and clap your hands uh, and tell him, thank you for your mercy. Uh, thank you for your grace. Uh, thank you for your loving kindness. Uh, thank you for your goodness. Uh, thank you for your love. Uh, thank you for Calvary. Uh, thank you for your blood. Uh, Good God in the morning time. When you're in the hands of God, amen, his blood has got to get on your Lady Jones. There's no way you can be in the hand of God and his blood not touch you. And that's why he can say, when I see the blood, I'll pass by. Mercy says, pass on by. Mercy says, I see the blood. Mercy says, leave him alone. Come on and clap your hands for the last time and say thank you Jesus for your mercy oh hallelujah hallelujah I don't need to be standing here right now Woo, somebody look at your neighbor and say it is enough God's going to say it is enough I don't know when he's going to say it, uh, but the scripture said, God said, uh, it is enough. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's it enough. Uh, it's enough. It's enough. It's enough. It's enough. Tell yourself, one day God's going to say, it is enough. Woo! Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Mercy is going to say, it is enough. Woo, God, I thank you. Let's give the men of God, hallelujah, a hand praise for the word of God. I say the word of God. Woo, God, hallelujah. God sees us right where we are. Woo, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God, hallelujah. You know, I called for repentance last week. And I truly believe that everyone that was obedient and repented unto God. Woo, Holy Ghost, I thank you. Hallelujah. There is a, it is enough. Woo, coming your way. Oh, Holy Ghost, come out. Woo. So much is enough. God's going to say it is enough. Woo, hallelujah, hallelujah. David had to repent first. Woo, hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. The man of God has preached. Woo, God. But I feel the afterburners in my heart. Oh, kadadaboshaya. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. My God, my God. Uh, and don't let me get on, amen, rebuilding the altar. Oh, hallelujah. Woo, God, hallelujah. Hallelujah. David said, I won't let Arona give me what God, what's got, what God is already, amen. It costs him, it's going to cost you. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I won't take something freely. Amen. But what I need to pay for. Elder White Sign, when you was preaching about the altar, you know, Elijah had to rebuild the altar. Oh, God, Holy Ghost. I'm not going to preach. But I do want to tell you this right here. Ooh, holy. I feel like it now. <laughs> Ooh, 
Hallelujah. I feel like it. Hallelujah. 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 I feel that it is enough in my life and it's coming my way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, God, hallelujah. The scripture said that we're serving an absolute God with absolute power. And Psalm 62 and 11 said that God has spoken once but twice. Have I heard it? That power, that authority, that dominus belongeth unto God Almighty. It is enough. Woo. Oh, Holy Ghost. God, I thank you. You know, the first thing that when you rebuild an altar, you put the sacrifice, the sacrifice, the ram, the bullock, whatever you come to God for, you put the sacrifice first on the altar. I hear the Bible says in Romans 12, he said, Pre present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, not man, but unto God Almighty, which is your reasonable service. Uh, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. Thank you, Thank you. God want to sacrifice. Yes, oh, my God. Holy Ghost, I thank you. Let's give the man of God. I'm fired up. I'm fired up, but God used him, amen, for his glory. And we thank God for that, amen. In the name of Jesus, God wants real people and a real church. Amen. Hallelujah to God. I don't know if y'all been looking at the news, but Iran attacked Israel. Only because Israel killed some of Iran's leaders. I'm not quite sure what they were. I start to say God, but I might be wrong. But what I'm trying to tell you is the Bible clearly says in Matthew 24 that when you see these things happening, yeah, when you hear these things happening, but if somebody's messed up and mixed up, it ain't no time to fight. It ain't no time to throw rocks. No time to bite, bite. No time to kill with the mouth. When you see these things happening, he says, stand in the holy place because your redemption draweth high. Nah, nah. nah it's nearer than you think. Amen. 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 Right. Amen. Right. Woo. Amen. Hallelujah. We said we want to go to heaven. Amen. But our actions are not lying up with our mouth. Amen. The Lord said, these folks serve me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Amen. Hallelujah. He said, the word is nigh thee in thy mouth. And I believe it says in thine heart. Why? That thou mayest do it. We don't have the word just to have it. Amen. We got to exercise James say, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Amen. Oh, Holy Ghost, I thank you. Thank you. Ooh, I'm going to ask the secretary to come. I feel my, maybe I should walk up here, amen, I walk back to my seat and then we're going to ask our, oh, hallelujah to God. Ask our deacons to come, amen, and prepare to receive our offer. Let's give the men of God another hand and praise. 